As a UX designer, I'm sure you are familiar with a few challenges today. And I'm going tonight to talk about those and how we may address those with atomic design and style guides. For me, I can see three major challenges today as a UX designer. And the first of all is the multi-device universe that we live in. When I started to work as a front-end developer, I, my biggest challenge was to make my web designs consistent for like a handful of browsers, and it was desktop browsers. And today, I have uh, ever-changing variances of smartphones and desktops, of course, but netbooks and tablets and phablets and uh, game consoles and TVs and even more. And along with this, we also have the big digital transformation happening, uh, which is what you can call the fact that organizations are expanding their web presence rapidly, and they no longer have just one page, one web page. They have a number of web pages for and applications for different scenarios and different use cases. And that is a challenge, I think, to, to keep the consistency and the brand recognition in all these systems and applications. And uh, third, the least, but the last but not least <laughs> of these three challenges is the lack of user experience and front-end strategy that we see. Organizations tend to not understand how important it is and to see the value of strategic user experience development. And this makes us wanting to throw all our web designs away every third year, since it seems much easier to begin brand new than to maintain and refine what we already have. It's very out with the old and in with the new. Uh, and the key issue of these challenges is that users engage with companies and organizations across many channels, including the web, but also with email uh, and with um, mobile devices, but even in physical stores. And for these inter interactions to be effortless, the visual design and the interactions need to be consistent across all of these channels. And we have worked a long time with responsive design. I'm sure you know this concept with responsive design. And we, it's good to opti optimize screen resolutions and optimize for different devices, but it's far from enough. We're way beyond responsive design. <coughs> we are now talking about designing for content that may appear in an, in, in an incomprehensible number of situations and in an incomprehensible number of devices. And I think that this quote by Jacob Nielsen summarized the essence of this very well. Consistency is one of the most powerful usability principles. When things always behave the same, users don't have to worry about what will happen. Instead, they will know what will happen based on earlier experience. Consistency builds brand trust and it helps users complete their tasks much faster. And if I have a bad experience with an organization online, I'm much less likely to, to visit it, this organization in store, and vice versa. Your brand is only as good as my last experience with you, no matter where it is. So how do we success with good consistency, cross-platform and cross-device? I will give you an example. What is Facebook? Is Facebook an app? Or is Facebook a blue and a white website? Or is Facebook an app and a blue and a web white website? Facebook is actually a system, 
a system of connected components which exist independently and in aggregated views. When we think about designing websites or pages or apps, we are missing the bigger opportunity. Everything is connected. So we should be designing systems, not destinations. Because the user journey I described earlier, it has no single goal, it has no destination. We need to design systems that can carry the users through the journey. And when we are designing systems, it's much easier for us to see the whole picture. We can collect common design patterns and components and show them whatever we want. But to realize a design system, we need to be building our front end on a modular architecture. And this means that you design and you develop small pieces of interface components entirely standalone. For example, if this is our organization, and this organization has an external web page, an app, an intranet, and a client portal. Uh, each of these wants an image carousel. We should have one image carousel with one code base and one design concept. <coughs> and this image car carousel should be able to transform to all different screen sizes, to both small and wide columns, and regardless of the, of the context. <coughs> but a design system, I can feel that it can be a bit abstract when you see it like this. It's like components in cyberspace. Uh, we need to package it and show it somehow so that we can collaborate around it and see it. And for that, we need a style guide. A style guide used to be a static PDF document containing a brand's look and feel, the logo type, colors, maybe fonts, and perhaps how to use those. Um, but the thing is, it was static. And a style guide should be much more than that. It should be live, it should be online, it should be dynamic. And it should also include much more than colors. We need the interactions, we need the animations, and we need to know why we are using exactly these animations and those interactions in these situations. We need the processes and we need the directives. So a modern style guide, it can look like this. this is Yelp's style guide. Gov UK has also a style guide. Lonely Planet is my favorite. I, uh, if you haven't seen this, I recommend you all to, to do that, and navigate, and especially read the articles about how they work with it, because it's, it's really inspiring. And this is the Salesforce style guide, which I will return to. Uh, quite soon. <laughs> <coughs> the largest part of a style guide is the component library. And this is where we gather all the components, but also the design patterns to show them in every possible state. So if we look at the uh, Salesforce style guide again, and uh, zoom in <laughs> to uh, the button component, you can see here uh, how it may look like. And this is quite common. You have description on how to use the component. And I hope you see, but this is the <laughs> actual component. It should be borders there. <laughs> um, we have code example. We have HTML and a CSS example. And here you have all the variants of this button. So you can see how to use it in verse and in different states and with icons and so on. So this is what you may see in a component library. <coughs> the
depending on the organization scale, the component library can be quite big and it can be quite abstract. And I have found it hard to draw a distinction between what is a component and which exact parts of a user interface should be a component. And something that has helped us is working with a methodology that is called atomic design. <coughs> and atomic design is uh, a methodology that is invented by a famous front-end developer, uh, Brad Frost. And basically, it's about dividing the components into more concrete parts. And also, we, with this dividement, we can have a, a common uh, terminology to talk about. <coughs> so, first of all, we define the atoms. These are the fundamental building blocks that comprise all our user interfaces. And they are so small that they can't be broken down any further. If we would break them down any further, they would really cease to be functional. Um, and uh, stand alone, they may seem quite useless, but as a component. But this header, this date, and this blue button, this is things that we want to store and reuse. And they should look the same, regardless of application or context they are shown in. Molecules are a group of atoms functioning as a unit. And molecules is the smallest possible unit that we can inherit standalone from the component library. So it's, it's, uh, we see mo molecules as actual components. <laughs> and then organisms, they are molecules composed to an organism, and possibly even atoms uh, could be composed. And the organisms form a distinct section of a user interface. It can example be for as an event listening, as in this page, these are event molecules, but together as a group we have an event listening organism. But usually we talk about organism perhaps as a header or a footer, that those are kind of standard organisms. <laughs> And templates, these are the ones who places our organisms or atoms and molecules into a layout. It's the glue that holds it all together. And basically it's just a grid. <coughs> so designers and developers can come and go in projects. And the style guide should record not only components and the design decision, but also the processes and the methodologies. And it can be processes for creating a new component, it can be making variations, report a bug, or making new design decisions. But this all should be documented in the style guide. Style guide driven development, is that a term that someone of you have heard of before? Someone? <laughs> no? Okay, it's a relative new concept, um, but I'm very fond of it because this, it refers to the process of working with a style guide as the single source of truth. The style guide should always be the starting point of all front-end development in any way. The user experience designer should base all decision based in the style guide. And the same for a front-end developer, a system developer, an art director, a project leader, any stakeholder. We should always look in the style guide first. And that is what style guide driven development is. Style guide driven development affects the entire value chain. A common way of uh, consuming the style guide in a component library is to make a complete front-end solution. And um, that means that a back-end developer would here copy and paste a component into the application, applic application 
I'm making this quite easy now. I, I'm sure that uh, systems developer do more than that. But what I'm trying to say here is that we break uh, the commitment here between. So we have two code bases to maintain when we do that. And there's a chance that the component when it's in the application will be starting to look different over time. <coughs> and right now I am working with a client where we have um, developed an API, a REST API, where we render components real time, both in the style guide and in the applications. So we have only one single code base. So any update in the component library will benefit all the applications which are using this component. And we see a lot of other organizations heading this way. Uh, and uh, this is not something that I or the client I work with have come up with. We have been very inspired by the Lonely Planet style guide, which I showed you earlier. Um, but there are also others that uh, do the same. And this is the most ideal solution since the style guide will always be up to date. It will ne never go out of time. <coughs> So the last part of the style guide is the directives and the terminology. The style guide should also be describing the overarching goals of the organization. It could be the web directives, like, and also like which browsers do we optimize for, which level of accessibility do we meet. And um, the style guide should also describe directives on a component level. And that's more about how, which purpose does this component have? And wh when and why should we use it? And which parameters and settings can I pass into this component? And um, another important aspect, um, which we tend to forget, is the naming conventions and the glossary which may seem quite basic, but does everyone understand what a touch slero high hero image is? <laughs> or a, a teaser or a utility toolbar? Um, it can be quite good for all, um, all the competences to see this in the style guide. Can we just make this button a little bigger? It seems like an easy task to make this button a little bigger. <coughs> but how does, this how does this change affect the entire design system? Should all buttons be bigger? Then of course we should make this change. But random variations without purpose is a no-no since they are extremely expensive to maintain in the long run. And they also gamble with the overall consistency. And style guides you empowers you to make informed decisions and ask all of these questions. It provides a more credible resource to, on which to make design decisions and to prioritize our efforts and easily refer to conventions. There are so many areas in which I strongly believe that a style guide will make a difference. And I'm not going to go into all this because I could have listed three more pages. <laughs> but it will help you with consistency and it will speed up our rapid prototyping and it will help us to save money in the long run. Style guides will future proof our investments because if you have a UX strategy, it will allow the number of applications to grow for an organization without the front end code and design becoming harder to maintain. And it will enforce dry code. And by that I mean it will enforce more clean code. It will enforce a non repetitive code that impacts page performance as little as possible. 
It will also allow us designers to be more creative. It seems like a lot of rules, but I'm sure that nobody wants to reinvent the wheel or over and over again, and no one wants to solve the same browser issues in Internet Explorer hour and hour again. And style guides will help us to reuse our components so that we can focus on what matters. We can focus on refinement and coming up with new cool designs and functions. Because I think that having the courage to go first doesn't mean going impulsively without a plan. Going first is about making all bold but informed decisions. I strongly believe that style guides will change your life forever. Thank you.